great pleasure it is to welcome to What's Next, a company that deals in What's Next, literally, and uh, the URL certainly reflects that. We talk about the Internet of Things and really creating um, a, 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 like, almost like a central nervous system of what your organization is. And we hear of the, the Internet of Things being made up of billions of billions of sensors creating valuable data. So Lazo, Lazo Karpaganiotidis, who is the Chief Product and Marketing Officer at IoT.next, joins us uh, for this episode, as well as Vusi Ngomezulu, who is the Head of Sales at IoT.next. And that's the URL. Check it out, IoT.next. Now, if I had to meet you both in a lift, um, and we literally had uh, 15 seconds between floors, and I say, what do you guys do at IoT.next? Uh, what would you say, Lazo, and what would you say, Vusi? Let me start with you, Lazo. What do, what do you do for a living at IoT.next? What do you guys do? So, uh, thanks, Aki. Uh, we take the data that's available from the millions, as you said, of things, uh, sensors, devices, assets in the field, which we call operational technology. Uh, we combine that with um, systems, applications from businesses, which you call IT, typically. We put all of that together uh, to um, organize and orchestrate that data to create insights that helps businesses basically make better decisions more proactively. So understanding the data and making sense of it. Uh, Vusi, um, what, what do you say? Because you, you, you're the head of sales, so I guess your pitch would be slightly different, right? Oh, yes. I think I start from the premise that what you can't measure, you can't manage. And that's exactly what we do. We bridge that gap. We allow you to measure anything on the edge and then allow you to manage that edge and visualize all of, that, all of those disparate worlds on a single pane of glass which is really our value add in terms of our IoT platform, and then allow you to then make informative decisions with all that data that we're able to take learnings from and convert into information that can then advance businesses in that regard. Okay, well, listen, super exciting. I'm looking forward to unpacking this. And it's such an important part of doing business today and really getting in insights into your business that you never knew you could get. And, and important insights because these insights guide you to doing better business, being a better global citizen in the business world, and also understanding what's happening in your organization. So, uh, Lazo, IoT and ESG, these are two common things that we hear about. Uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, is more commonly known, but if we had to unpack those two terms, uh, what is your understanding when you hear these abbreviations, IoT and ESG? Yeah, no, those are, those are uh, acronyms that are thrown around quite liberally these days. Um, ESG, first of all, stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. Um, ESG, in a sense, is an evolution of what we, I think, were brought up in uh, the old business uh, world was the triple bottom line, which was uh, profits, planets, and people. But I think ESG is a little bit more of a modern take on that, where you're finding that um, consumers and investors have become form far more savvy and far more socially conscious, obviously enabled by social media and access to information. And, 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 and um, people are now asking more questions of the companies that they invest in, of the companies that they buy from. Hence uh, why ESG has become such a talking point uh, around the C-suite because um, ESG is now a proxy of the social responsibility of businesses, but also now a proxy of the share price of how well managed, how socially conscious an organization is and how well geared they are for the future and the future consumer. Now, the second part of your question, IoT, the Internet of Things, how do those two come together? Well, as Vuzi said, what you, what you can't measure, you can't manage. So IoT being uh, the availability of data, so like the nervous system, as you said, of your, of your business, we, we, we basically coined uh, a, a point of view that said, what if your business could speak to you? What would it say about your ESG? So if you think about the assets, the devices, the sensors that connect basically the networks of processes, people, and technology in your business, how do, what will that data say about your ESG? And that's all enabled through the technology um, and underpinned by IoT and data analytics. So if you bring those three, the, those two concepts together, we believe you have a formidable um, offering to start tackling the beast that is ESG. No, that's absolutely fascinating. And, and, and Vusi, I guess it's almost like you're adding more transparency, you know, by, by, by shedding light on these things to people to have a look 
at how your organization is operating, how responsible your organization is. There's a great deal of transparency. What's, what's your take on the current status of ESG? Yeah, so I think the, the, the current state is that naturally there is a lot of confusion in the world in how people approach ESG. You know, it's like undergoing an audit. Everyone knows that there was audits and you need to report financially. Then there are BE codes to adhere to. Now there's ESG to adhere to. But in essence, the current status, people are failing really to understand that it's all in light of benefiting the environment, society and improved governance. So this is not anything new. We're just saying start monitoring more vigilantly what you're doing environmentally and start tracking actually just how much of a societal impact any of your activities are doing and governance is nothing new. Have a formalized way of reporting and recording all these metrics and then improving on that. So I think the current state and I mean I'm part of the future of sustainability's uh, uh, members and you can see that because people are used to things that are gazetted and are given formalized structure by government, like a mining charter, then they are able to follow through on what's required. But without there being a very clear framework that is led by states that then cascades down to organization, everyone's still all over the place, figuring themselves out how do they approach ESG? How do they get net zero emissions? How do they, you know, what, look at environmental metrics? and how their corporate social investments actually have impact on the people who are doing that. And then obviously just offering the proof that they are complying, which is natural governance, which has been there for years. So I think what's really missing in the current state is really to have the framework consolidated even from national levels, from governments to say, this is not only a corporate focus, but it's a global focus. Therefore, let it be led by leadership of nations and cascaded down and measured and monitored by organizations. Jeff, that's so interesting. And then, you know, we, 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 sit, we, we touched on the fact that you are being more transparent to your customers and the outside world, but you're being more uh, transparent to the internal runnings of the organization, people within the organization can see what you're doing socially, what you're doing about the environment, what your governance is like. So it puts everybody on the same page. And I guess it can be quite inspirational as well. So Lazo, when you look at what we've been talking about, can you unpack some of the most innovative and impactful ways that businesses are using IoT, for example, to address these ESG challenges that you and Vusi have been talking about? Sure. Yeah. We so, so we see it. We see it across many verticals, from um, mining to telco to smart buildings, and um, um, I think many more. But um, what we're starting to see is is corporates taking a lot more um, a lot more introspective insight into the buildings which they operate. That's just one example, but one we're seeing as a sort of a, a hot area. Uh, mind, mind the mind the pun. Um, so if you think of the statistic that the World Economic Forum put out, that 40% of carbon emissions are from buildings alone, that, that, that begs some serious questions. And we're starting to see that in some of the asks which we're starting to get, where corporates are starting to be a lot more conscious about the emissions and the usage of their buildings. Now we're, we're, we're sort of recovering or um, close to recovery from a post-pandemic world. And if you think about the usage of office space, just, just, just for one example, um, corporate real estate owners are starting to take um, a lot more closer looks into how their buildings are used um, and, and building um, portfolio managers and building managers are starting to take a similar look, but more how effectively they're running their building. So ESG and cost factors are starting to also intertwine. So they're starting to look at how the energy usage patterns are evolving. But how do you do that if you don't know how your building has been used? So people are starting to combine that energy usage with um, tariff engines as well as occupancy monitoring. So at, at what times of the day are certain floors full? And I'm pretty sure you've driven around at night and driven past an office block and, see, and, and asked yourself, wow, why are all the lights on? Surely not everyone's at work, you know? 
So you apply similar logic to air conditioners, things that people plug in and other, other facilities that, 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 that operate in a building. You start asking more questions on, on how effectively you're running that. You apply it to water, gas, which is more prominent um, across Europe and, 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 and uh, other countries uh, brought about by um, um, the war in Ukraine. You start asking yourself, wow, this, is, this gets a lot bigger and deeper. And then you start plugging in other factors like environmental monitoring, so air quality. Um, what is the air quality in, in your mall? What is the air quality in your factory? What is the air quality in your office block? How well are you treating people and how productive can they be? And all of a sudden you start looking at the picture and you say, wow, we can bring all of this data together. We can help landlord, uh, landlords uh, plan more, plan more, uh, more ahead um, and you help building managers run their buildings a lot better. And, and that's now starting to influence how people design spaces for the future, because before you didn't have that data, you didn't know the patterns in which people would operate in those buildings. So you bring that all together. You don't only have a formidable um, OPEX and CAPEX tool, but you also have a tool to manage your ESG offsets. Um, and one more factor that I'll add to that is what we're seeing in our more mature markets is um, what social citizen are you? You know, if you're if you're the person on the block that keeps their lights on, keeps all the air cons pumping, and 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 doesn't basically switch things off when they should, the implication is you're putting off more carbon emission. You, you, the implication is you're not being a responsible citizen, and you apply that to many um, other downstream or upstream processes. For example, in in mining, uh, in manufacture, uh, you, you apply a similar level of thinking on data. And as Busy said, what you can't measure, you can't manage. Bringing that all together, giving it to the G part of ESG governance, giving it to C-level executives, operational managers, decision makers, to switch things off, to look deeper into things that might be causing more carbon offsets, you start solving this more innovatively and more proactively. Wow. I, I didn't realize the complexities. Every time you mentioned the stat, and uh, I mean, that 40% number that you that you sent out is, is quite astonishing. I guess those legacy buildings that are, you know, 30, 40, 50 years old, for example, those are probably some of the big culprits out there. But, you know, Vusi, when you talk to your customers, uh, what do you hear are their biggest ESG challenges that, that you come across? And I guess that when you look, and as, as Laza was talking about uh, the energy usage, and, and I'm thinking about load shedding, and I'm thinking about every time there's load shedding, these big diesel generators, and you see the black smoke coming out of many of the buildings, and I'm thinking to myself, that's going into the environment, I automatically start drawing um, some kind of negativity, should I say, to an organization that's polluting the environment in that way, and it seems to be happening a lot more often. But, you know, load shedding is, is, you know, is unavoidable and businesses have to continue running. But I guess those challenges, one of them must be the, the fumes and the, the smoke that we're emitting because of having to continue business, right? What are the challenges you see in the ESG environment, Vusi? Just like any acronym that comes into play, the first resistance you get is that people have an expectation that it's going to cost an arm and a leg to comply. You know, everyone throws BEE at human capital executives, but ESG, if it is viewed organizational wide, has an operational benefit, has an HR benefit, has a financial benefit in all the efficiencies and savings seen, and even has an IT benefit to assist companies achieve some of the digital transformation roadmaps a whole lot sooner purely by having the ability to measure and manage. So I think the challenge is really ownership to say really whose responsibility is it in any industry to implement ESG principles properly but it's actually organizational wide because the benefit is not only one dimensional it's multi-organizational it's environmental, it is financial, you know, so I think that the challenge for me has really been ownership. But security is a big issue. And Lazo, the, you know, everyone talks about, uh, you know, cyber attacks, and you, you hear about the security of organizations and protecting your data, which is critical. How do you in this world where you hear many breaches happening through IoT systems, how do you prioritize the security and privacy? of your IoT systems and devices 
and 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 what measures have you taken to mitigate these potential risks? Because that's of course is always a big question. And and when you look at all the top risks in organisations today, security is number one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think I think the big caveat that people always put out there with IoT is all those devices per, um, in, enable more attack vectors into your business. So there's many ways uh, which you can look at defending yourself, and and we do that across the the spectrum. So everything from the actual device, um, we test what the device we put out, we test quite strenuous, strenuously. We cert uh, certain um, um, countries and, and unions also have certification standards, which we all obviously ascribe to. And we ensure that we talk to those devices only for the factors which we meant to talk to them for. Um, any other data is basically blocked out. And then obviously through our award-winning uh, Raptor technology, uh, we, we, won, we have won multiple awards for security itself, is that gateway. So all, all, all IoT data comes through a, a common gateway, which translates the different languages and protocols sensors speak in. That's, that is a critical point where you, you, you create that line of defense, where, you, where basically the technology says, hey, do I understand this data? Do I trust this data? Is it coming from a good actor and, and, and approved and certified actor? Can I let it in? And it sounds like there's a zero trust, trust principle and authenticating everything, not trusting anything that comes in and out. Um, but Vusi, when you look at organizations, you go into an organization, um, it is fragmented, let's be honest. Some people are using legacy systems, uh, different kinds of technologies all merged into one. How do you deal and how do you manage with that, that interoperability challenge and the integration of various systems and devices? Because I'm pretty sure that when you go and you see a company, they're using a whole lot of different things, aren't they? Yes, so I think that's, that's the main pain I try and alleviate. First and foremost, our intention is not to get in to rip and replace anything. Remember, you can walk into an organization that has a generator from the 1980s, but is working. All I'm saying is, how can you visualize all those working components and metrics digitally versus analogly? And how can you remotely start controlling those environments? And so that, that, that from one aspect is where we try to differentiate ourselves with agnosticity. We say, no, use what you use, carry on with what you're used to. But as opposed to having multiple usernames and passwords of disparate systems, let us integrate all of that so that you can visualize it on a single pane of glass. Then you are able to make organizational-wide, asset-wide, industry-wide decisions from a single control pane. Uh, uh, Vusi and Lazo, there, there must be challenges uh, that you face when you start implementing these IoT solutions. How, how do you overcome those particular challenges? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, uh, with any digitization effort, there, there are going to be challenges. And, and some of those are more from a, a governance perspective, i.e. who are the stakeholders and what is the actual business case that you're driving and who is vested in the digitization journey. And then the other ones are operational. And, and I'll unpack that and also sort of give you an answer on how, we, how we're trying to turn those challenges into opportunities for businesses, because we really believe in the power of digitization through IoT. So first of all, IoT has come full circle. Um, IoT 10 years ago was POCs. People would do, they plug a few IoT sensors, they'd orchestrate some data and say, oh, wow, look what we did. But those didn't translate into massive digital revolutions in organizations. But that technology, if you combine it with the cloud, you, you com combine it with machine learning, with powerful visualization, with mobile devices, all of a sudden IoT along with all of these factors starts becoming a strong proponent of digitizing businesses. So the legacy environments was he spoke about, start become, the, the business cases start becoming tangible and you start solving really big, juicy challenges. So, so Vusi, when you look at your clients and you talk to your clients, I mean, what, what kind of metrics do you use to measure the success of your IoT project? It's all very well to say, oh, this is what we're going to do in your organization, but who's measuring you and your IoT project? And how do you analyze and report on their impact? How does it work? And what kind of feedback do you give your, your customers? How do you measure what you're doing? So, so I, I always say that... Uh 
you know, if any customer is going to be given a tool to govern, like a platform or an ESG solution, they have to, in some way, shape or form, derive value from it, right? Because everyone is not only a consumer, they are eventually looking to derive value, you know? So when we speak of metrics, I mean, think of the environmental metrics. Naturally, I can monitor things like kilowatt hours, water volumes, air particle matter, you know, waste output and how people are reusing some of these resources. But the actual value you want them to get from that is to know the carbon and toxic emissions so that they're able to report on them. For them to know things like resource intensity of certain operations, even by location, you know, and then utility usage by facility facility owners and even various locations. But me implementing something like occupancy monitoring, which is the metric, allows them to then further be able to analyze all the other metrics like energy and water per capita. So now I'm able to actually know that based on me having visibility to the number of people occupying my building, I'm able to equate that usage to per square meter and per individual. So I know that actually at peak capacity, chances are I'll be consuming so many levels of power and so many liters of water. Well, let me end off by asking you both this question. And you, you, you mentioned the word quantify. How, how do you think that IoT is changing the way businesses uh, think about sustainability and social responsibility. Let me start with you, Vusi, and then I'm going to come to you, Lazo. Yeah, so I think, you know, corporate social responsibility before was just deemed as uh, donating to those in need without necessarily measuring the long-lasting impact around that. And for me, that's what sustainability is. It's not about dropping a PC today on a kid, it's around how will you ensure that that child and their community are digitally enabled going forward for longer to allow them to not focus on the socioeconomic needs, but to start exposing them to digital needs, to global trends, to, to, to bigger needs. So I think in essence, our approach on IoT is to say, Anything can be digitized, but don't just digitize for the sake of digitizing. Understand the why. Understand the who for. So we start with heart. I always say if you if you if you can unpack your why, then how and what you do becomes irrelevant. And I think it's about how organizations look to marry why they're doing it and then look to digitize with how and what they're doing it for because really i think as much as they are driven by profits there are enough global case studies to show that companies that remain profitable are the ones that are good at actually telling you why they do it versus okay. those that focus on the how and what you know so i think marrying the two with digitization and technology will really give a more sustainable impact of applying iot principles and guess what you you don't even have to worry about the profits because the profits will come in terms of you having the right intent and if that okay. intent is met then it does multiply into profits in my view makes perfect sense what's your take lazo yeah i mean i i've i've uh, i've seen it from a consulting angle um from an imp implementation angle too and um Digitization is a journey, and if you if you if you the root is in data, and and the first thing people ask from data is what is happening in my business, but that what then matures to why is this happening in my business? So to type with Uzi, it all starts with getting the data, understanding the business factors a lot more, bringing in additional use cases because that data uncovers more insight. It starts begging more questions from the organization to say, hmm. Now that I can see X, what does that mean for Y? You know, what are the downstream impacts of improving certain E or S factors? How do I govern better? And then going into the Y. So we've moved everything from a simple example, a 
where we've helped a, we've helped a business achieve 25 percent energy savings simply by saying switch off the chillers at a certain threshold and switch them on at a certain threshold versus just saying rely on people to do it or rely on certain schedules to do it um, all the way to helping organizations understand through machine learning when there are drastic differences in potential fuel pilfering or clear damage to an asset or component of an asset because certain factors start going completely out of kilter and then also helping quantify what that impact might be to create an urgency out of risk and impact of the of the event occurring further and then sharing that across um, um, use uh, uh, um, case management systems in the, in the organization. Yeah. So all of those are starting to merge a lot more, but it starts with practical use cases, practical business cases, and going on that journey. So I'll leave it with, uh, on, on that note. No, that's absolutely brilliant. And, and you know, as we've been talking, I was just thinking about my own home, for example, and you know, the fact that I've got solar, the fact that I've got you know, a lot of these IoT devices and air cons and that sort of thing all talking to each other. What about a, a consumer version of the social responsibility that you're talking about? Why is there no mini product to measure what my uh, emissions as, as, a, as a citizen of this world, as a global citizen, how sustainable am I in my own environment? You mentioned businesses, but maybe in the future there's an opportunity to do a consumer version of all of this. And and you, you, you're, quite, you're quite right, Aki, and the, I think the the desire and the drive is there, but as we know, you know, the fish rots from the head. So, like I said, yeah. is that the challenge is leadership. You actually need to drive the right mentality from the top down. And consumers have started wanting to monitor their panels, seeing how much power they've used over time. But let that cascade into water. Let that cascade into yes. how you can challenge yourself to actually use as much natural light for as long as possible before you feel tempted to switch on the light. How can you not yes. constantly boil the kettle multiple times? I see it on a very simple use case we're working on now where the whole aim is for the insurer to monitor everyone's geezer because they say the resultant damage of a geezer bursting, most of the cost is towards the ceiling, the TV and the carpet that's now been damaged. But they don't get to look at the underlying benefit that actually they can lower their replacement costs as an insurer, which is a financial benefit. Houses right. can start using water more effectively and having less leakages which is a societal benefit and probably exactly. when geezers are switched on and how often they are run can actually even help with load balancing in regions right. and so we could experience less load shedding by just monitoring that geezers are not all heated at 6 a.m when everyone wants to take a shower you can heat them incrementally and ensure during the day they shouldn't be heating because children are either at school or parents are either in operation. So it's, it is it is cascading down to a consumer level, but I think, you know, like I said, the fish rots from the head. So we yeah. need to take a real leader-based approach and start driving that narrative in our general social and environmental messaging on a daily until it cascades to, irrespective of the income status of any household, they must want to look after the environment and ensure that they're contributing towards a societal impact. Lots to think about. Vusi Ngome Zulu, Head of Sales at IoT.next, and uh, Lazo Karpaganiotidis, who's the Chief Product and Marketing Officer at IoT.next. Gents, thank you so much for joining us and sharing those fascinating insights about IoT.next and what you guys do. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, you for having us, Aki. Thank you.